ICNA Sisters, the Online Islamic Institute of Women proudly presents our program today as part of a larger series entitled Your Social Justice Roadmap. Up until now, we have been scratching the surface on a variety of social justice issues, such as what social justice means in the Islamic perspective versus worldly perspective, the true reality behind Islamophobia, and knowing our constitutional rights as Americans. We are living in ever increasing uncertain times full of doubts and despair, but we will remain resilient in the face of adversity and educate ourselves with the right tools to navigate our futures. With that, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today, Brother Ramiz Abed. Brother Ramiz Abed graduated from George Mason University with a BS in Information Technology. He has a BA in Islamic Studies from Islamic Online University. Brother Ramiz worked in the IT field from 2008 to 2014. In 2014, he became Director of Communication and Outreach for ICNA's Council for Social Justice. Brother Ramiz initially joined ICNA as a volunteer in 2008 on various projects, including as a community organizer and fundraiser. He served as a youth coordinator for two years, then as the president of the ICNA Mosque in Alexandria, Virginia, for two more years before joining ICNA Council for Social Justice in 2014. His topic for today is unveiling the dynamics of bullying for us as adults and understanding the microaggressions that come along with it and how without identifying these problems it could lead to bigger conflicts please keep in mind towards the end of his presentation we will be taking your questions regarding the topic at hand so please feel free to start jotting them down uh, in the chat boxes as he is speaking and they will be answered in real time by brother ramiz towards the end inshallah now Without any further delay, I would like to welcome Brother Ramiz Abed. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm glad to be speaking on this very important topic. We've been speaking on this topic, particularly bullying, for many years now. Um, so it's a huge problem in our country, in our nation. And uh, it definitely needs to be addressed. And unfortunately, not a lot of people are aware of how to deal with it or how to, or what it is or how to properly understand it. So I hope we can clear that some of that up today, inshallah. Um, um, before we continue, uh, are we are we on the first slide? What is bullying, uh, Sister Nadia? I yes, can't sir. see this. Uh, okay. 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 Okay, so let's start with the definition. What exactly is bullying? So bullying is basically uh, it's, it's defined as unwanted or aggressive behavior, uh, which must include three things, meaning if any one of these three things is missing, it's not considered bullying, technically speaking. Uh, it might be harassment, it might be something else, but it, it technically, uh, from the book definition of bullying, it will not be, uh, it will not be considered the book definition of bullying. Number one, uh, the first condition is that there, that the, the perpetrator has a hostile intent and is not accident, meaning the person is not uh, playing around, they're not joking, they're not like uh, unintending something. No, they they are, they want to physically, emotionally, or psychologically help, uh, psychologically harm the victim in some form or some shape. That's the first condition, that the aggressor or the perpetrator must have actual intent to cause harm to the victim in some form or format. That's condition number one. Condition number two is that there's an imbalance of power, meaning uh, the bully has some sort of power over the victim in some capacity. It might be physical strength. It might be access to some embarrassing information. It might be popularity. It might be because of because he's a supervisor or he has more authority over the victim. Um, uh, and, 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 and it also can occur in between adults and the kid situations as well. Uh, but yeah, there's some sort of that. So there's, there's something about the bully which makes him or her powerful over the victim in some, in some capacity. So there's an imbalance of power in some sort. And the third condition is that it happens over and over again. It's, it's repetition. It might be weekly, it might be monthly, it might be daily, but it's not a one-off thing. It's not like something that happened like at a picnic one time and then it never, you know, happened again. It's not like that. It's, it's something that, that the perpetrator continually 
target that same victim over and over and over again. So this is a proper definition of bullying um, as accepted by the majority of researchers today. Um, now there are attempts to kind of make the definition more strict, um, but right now as we speak, this is the uh, more widely accepted proper definition of what consists of bullying. And this is important to understand because um, uh, before we label something as bullying, whether it relates to our kids or ourselves, we must make sure that it, it basically it, it is confined within uh, this definition, because it helps with because if it fails in because if something is not technically considered bullying, then you can't really use it in a in like a legal case or something or when you bring it to authorities or something like that. So we want to make sure that what what is happening to us is actually bullying before we call it bullying from that angle. Okay, so this is the definition. Now, if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> now, there are different types of bullying. Um, there's verbal bullying, basically anything that happens with your tongue, uh, name calling, inappropriate comments, making fun of someone, being harsh verbally towards someone, uh, gossiping, insulting, uh, you know, calling them terrorists, or whatever it may be. Uh, anything that happens with the tongue, uh, again, with the intention of the person harming the victim in some capacity, either emotionally or physically. In this case, emotionally and psychologically, because it's verbal. Um, and it's, uh, again, there's a power imbalance, and there's, it's happening over and over again. There's also something called social bullying, which basically means, um, it has different, it, has, uh, it mainly refers to things like where, where the perpetrator is trying to basically um, spread gossip about someone, or they're trying to spread false information about someone, or they're leaving someone out on purpose. It happens a lot among um, kids particularly, but also adults, for example, you know, you're invited to the, you, 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 you get invited to a someone's party. I mean, everyone gets invited to someone's party, but you are named as someone who is not invited to the party uh, or that meeting, for example, in a workplace, it might happen in that capacity, that it's a very important meeting and you are part of the team, uh, but you are not invited to the meeting at all uh, uh, on purpose. And whoever is con considering that meeting, they're doing it on purpose to cause you harm in some capacity. Uh, also, um, releasing or uh, uh, embarrassing someone in public also is a form of social bullying as well. Uh, physical bullying, I think most people are familiar with this. This is what most people think about when they think about bullying is hitting, spitting, pushing people or getting physical with someone. That's what most people think about, but there are other types of bullying here as well, uh, as I just explained. Okay, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> here we have common examples. Uh, Cyberbullying, which is a big, big thing nowadays because of social media. So it's basically uh, sharing public informa uh, embarrassing information about someone uh, to the social media or attacking or insulting someone um, through the social media platforms, whether it's TikTok, uh, Twitter, Facebook, what doesn't matter. Um, and back in the day, it used to be forums as well, uh, text messaging, whatever it is. Basically, whatever we just discussed in the previous slides is basically uh, all of the verbal things that happen there or in the social bullying atmosphere, but it's happening in the digital realm uh, on the internet. So this is uh, called cyberbullying. <clears throat> um, workplace bullying, uh, this refers to uh, examples of this include like undermining colleagues, for example, you know, um, um, try somehow trying to uh, um, uh, cause some sort of harm to your work, a person, uh, uh, to your coworker. Um, in order to basically maybe not get them the promotion or basically try to get them fired or whatever it is, or, or trying to just make them feel uh, embarrassed and things like that, insulting them at the workplace. So it happens there as well, or making them feel bad because of their religious background or whatever it may be, or their color of their skin. Uh, so all of this can occur in workplace bullying as well. <clears throat> uh, school bullying. Uh, this is basically what happens in schools today with teasing, exclusion, physical harm, making fun of, threading rumors, cyberbullying them, um, and uh, spreading uh, misinformation about them or their families or personal information that is embarrassing to them, uh, to the schools, to the, uh, to the to all their friends, getting texted or getting putting it on Twitter or Instagram and just tagging them and basically in order to embarrass them. So all of this, uh, all of these fall under. Um, when it comes to the school atmosphere, cause falls under school bullying. <clears throat> okay, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, okay, now, how do we respond to bullying? What is the proper way to respond when someone is being a bully? Um, number one is we say assertive communication. Basically, it is to clearly express 
that you are dis that you are uh, uncomfortable with what's happening, and you have to set boundaries with the perpetrator. You have to let them know clearly and confidently that hey, you don't appreciate what you're, they're saying, and that this is not, um, and that uh, you can either, either tell them that you will report it to the authorities, or um, but you have to be assertive from the beginning. You have to let the perpetrator know uh, that. What's happening is uh, you that uh, you're considering it bullying and uh, and harassment, and then you know you're not that uh, that you're very very uncomfortable with it, and you would like them to stop uh, in a clear and you know a vocal voice. Uh, we when it comes to kids, we usually tell them um, to do only to only do this if they feel safe. Uh, but we can extend that to adults as well uh, if you feel safe enough, and um, then you should uh, be assertive in your communication to let the bully know that you don't appreciate their behavior and then you need to set boundaries. Um, number two, uh, you, you should seek support. You have to reach out to family, friends, you need to talk to someone uh, about what's happening, your colleagues, you don't just internalize everything which is harmful to you uh, as, a, as a victim. So you should never just keep it all inside and not reach out to someone. Uh, you should definitely try to seek support uh, with uh, different levels of um, relationships um, that basically can help you out. And in, in workspaces, you usually have the HR department that you can talk to as well, or they have usually have designated people that you can talk to. And for school, for kids, we tell them uh, as well that either they should talk to a teacher or their uh, or someone that they trust, a trusted adult, um, which is usually their guidance counselor or someone who's designated that role at the school. <clears throat> um, report and document. You must document everything because this is evidence. Uh, because so you have to keep records of everything, and because when at times because it, once it, the situation gets escalated or doesn't stop, then you have to have all that evidence that you can basically present to the authorities or the um, the uh, the supervisors to report the person. And so you make sure everything is documented. Uh, you can have witnesses, uh, for example. You can also have if there's an email that was sent out uh, with a certain you know uh, language. You can you should save those. You print them out and save them somewhere. Um, if you have the ability of someone else, they basically recorded it or something. Uh, you should have, you should basically, uh, so you should have, uh, you should try to document as much as possible. Um, last one is the advocacy. Uh, you should definitely advocate for anti-bullying policies and you should participate in awareness campaigns, whether it comes to workplaces or you should, or also we tell kids when it comes to school atmosphere as well. And research has shown that when uh, when an environment as a whole comes together, whether it's in the school or workplace, where they say we will not tolerate bullying in our space, then it actually tends to go down more than people telling them not to do bullying. Uh, so this is very important because um, usually bullies are looking for an audience, and if they don't have an audience and they know that people will turn against them if they harass someone or they say some things about the other people, they will stay quiet and they will not go and go around and bullying people in those spaces because they know that their behavior will not be accepted. Um, Bullying, uh, usually, not always, but usually it uh, continues because it is continuously allowed to be accepted and perpetrated uh, without people taking action or soft standing up. So this is why well, we say always uh, that this is another way, a method of uh, ending bullying, which is or, or definitely uh, significantly reducing it by advocating anti-bullying policies and standing up for those who are being bullied and uh, doing awareness campaigns. Um, and uh, just taking it, taking the topic seriously because bullying is a form of trauma uh, that can have long-lasting impact on the victims. Uh, next slide. Uh, so that was bullying. Uh, in a quick show, there's a lot more to discuss on the bullying, but uh, we have a limited time, obviously. So um, I have a longer version of bullying uh, workshop you can see on YouTube. Uh, just type in my name, Ramiz Abid, anti-bullying workshop. It's a longer version. It's more catered towards kids, but uh, it might be helpful for those parents who are looking for more information on that topic. Uh, the second part we're going to talk about is microaggressions. Um, so this is the second part, so we'll discuss that in show now. <clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, this is Nadia, we're on the first slide now on microaggressions. I'm sorry, I can't see the, I'm not actually, I'm, I'm, I'm called in through my phone, so I can't see the screen. So I'm, uh, I'm, just, I'm just doing this blindly. Uh, Hoping that the correct slide is on the on the uh, on the screen, inshallah. Okay, so microaggression defined. Uh, so microaggressions are basically they're like uh, like very subtle uh, everyday conversations and interaction that we have among people, but they are full of bias. There's some sort of a bias behind the person, some sort of prejudice in the communication. And you have an example here 
uh, where someone tells you, you know, where are you really from? Like, you know, you tell them, someone comes, like happens all the time at doing workplaces. When you start a new job, for example, someone will come up to you uh, and they'll say something like, um, where are you from? And they'll say, I'm from uh, Kentucky or I'm from New York. They'll say, no, 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 where are you really from? Like, meaning that you're a foreigner to me uh, because you're not white, basically. And and uh, so you don't look like a typical American to me. So where are you actually? Tell me your home origin uh, of country. Which country are you, you know, ethnically from? That's what they mean. So this is called a microaggression, where there's some sort of a prejudice. You now the person might be not doing it on purpose. They might be subtle. They might be not un un unintentional, but it's basically it surfaces as a um, internal uh, prejudice or bias that the person has against a particular uh, group of people. Um, <clears throat> Uh, they are, uh, like, I, like it says in the slide here, they're often unintentional, but they can also contribute to a culture of exclusion. Yet it can make the person, the victim, uh, feel left out in some capacity or some way, or make them feel low, or make them feel um, uh, like the other, basically, and insecure in that space. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't always have to be verbal. It can also be body language, or how you behave with the person, or, you, or how the person, or how the, uh, the one who is doing the microaggression, how he comes across. Uh, how he formulates sentences and, and uh, language that he uses, he or she uses uh, towards the victim uh, to make them feel uh, different in some capacity and not equal to their colleagues. So that's what those are microaggressions. Um, those are called microaggressions. Uh, there are different types of microaggressions. Uh, some are called micro assaults, which are explicit intentional discriminatory action or sort. So this is when someone actually says to your face uh, something that is very, very discriminatory, or it's very, very uh, racially motivated, or it shows their like extreme, extreme bias towards a particular group of people. It's a common example in the Muslim context, we hear uh, people say, uh, not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslim. This is a microaggression. This is called a micro assault uh, because it is full of bias. Not only is it inaccurate, but it is also shows that the person is, has a very, very strong prejudice and is very, very, uh, bias towards Muslims <clears throat> or against Muslims. Um, and uh, so this is called a micro assault when the comment is very explicit um, in this uh, in this language. Another one is called micro insults. Um, these are subtle unconscious comments uh, or behavior that demand a person uh, that demean a person's identity. So for example, during a group of discussion a person could say um, uh, like someone maybe from a particular background that, you know, you're so articulate the way you, you know, uh, you're so articulate for someone from your background. Or they'll say like, you know, I never thought people like you would say something like this or um, meaning, meaning it, it basically they're, they're intending by that I didn't think that you guys were so intelligent, for example, you know, and uh, that, that I, I'm surprised at your comment, uh, at your comment, how, you know, how, how well versed you are. So they might be, again, this might be unconscious. They might be not intentionally doing it, but there's a hidden, um, bias inside the person, which is making them give like a micro insult. Um, it, it might also come across towards uh, females, for example, if someone like you know uh, says, for example, you know, women are so like it makes like a very generic comment towards women that is uh, that somehow excludes or makes them makes them feel low because of their gender. So it's also called a micro insult. Um, there's another one that's called micro invalidators, where basically there's a dismissive it's basically it's a type of comment that makes the person, the victim, feel uh, dismissed. All of their experience, their identity as a whole, is basically completely erased away, and like it doesn't matter. Uh, so you see, for example, some white people say like, "I don't see color; we're all the same." You know, like as if like black people don't have, um, like like people of color don't have any problems or they don't have any like it's, it's all the same to them. It's not the same. Or what you see now in the Palestine-Israel issue, you know, like um, I, I, you know, people will say. Uh, uh, things like, um, well, both sides are wrong, you know, or both sides are doing this because you're basically, because the Palestinians are the victims. They are the ones who are occupied and Israel is the occupier, right? They are the aggressor. It's not, it's not the same. You cannot say something like that and, um, assume that, uh, because, because that comes across that both sides are equally the same in power, in ability, in, in experiences, which is not the case because one side is, uh, you know, uh, has decades of discrimination, of killing, murder against them, and the other side is not like that. So you cannot say, so, you, so those are called micro invalidators, where you're basically dismissing a whole people's experience by making generic comments uh, 
about that uh, about those group of people. Again, the person might be doing it uh, unintentionally, but it is it is it does show ignorance. It shows uh, discriminate discriminate uh, prejudice, and it shows bias towards a uh, group of people. Okay, next slide. What is the impact of microaggressions? Uh, uh, so microaggression, like bullying, they can cause uh, emotional harm. They can um, kill a person's self-esteem, make them feel low, make them feel uh, unex uh, make them feel uh, not accepted, make them feel uh, bad about themselves, and also it creates a very hostile environment in in that place. So, so if, if there's a lot of microaggressions going on at work, um, the person who is being targeted, they will feel Othered, and they'll feel hostile. They'll feel they'll have anxiety when they come to work. They won't be able to focus. They'll always be um, fearful of their, uh, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow. What's going to what, what are they going to say tomorrow? What is my boss going to say today? What insulting comment are they going to make today? How are they going to joke away, you know, some sort of uh, problem in my community that's happening that affects my, me and my community, and they just kind of laugh it away, like how and how that makes them feel. Um, uh, they also they reinforce stereotypes, fostering culture of inequality. Yes, so basically the same stereotypes. Like I said, uh, microaggressions. Uh, the person who is doing the microaggressions, there is very visible. Uh, there's a very re there's there's a prejudice and there is um, uh, discrimination inside the person that is making them feel that way. So it just basically it, it reinforces the stereotypes of certain people um, from their background. Like the example we we said earlier about not all Muslims are terrorists, but most, but not all Muslims are terrorists, but um, but all terrorists are Muslims. So this is a type of stereotyping that happens that occurs. Um, okay, if we can go to the if we can go to the next slide. How to respond? How do we respond to microaggressions? Um, number one, we must acknowledge and reflect. We have to recognize that microaggressions that they have an impact. We have to teach that to people that microaggressions is a real thing because there's a huge denial out there that micro, there's no such thing as microaggressions and it's all the people being overly sensitive and things like that but it is an actual thing and we have to recognize it we have, and we have to basically educate the public about it we have to acknowledge it and reflect on it first and foremost and that's why a lot of actually today um, in most workplaces today they usually have training where they do give you a video about microaggressions as part of the training process of being cautious in your language and how you behave with people so most companies will do a um, video uh, training for uh, new employees so they understand that microaggression is uh, a real thing and then has it, that should not be tolerated. Um, um, you can also educate the perpetrator. Like I said, most people who are doing microaggression, they might not be aware that they are mic doing micro. They might be thinking they're just joking. They might be thinking that, um, oh, I'm just being real, or they might be thinking that, um, no, I'm just being, oh, I'm just making a general comment, right? They might not know, so it's it's good to start with educating them. Um, you don't have to do them, you don't you don't have to do it publicly, or you embarrass them in front of others because they might get defensive. But you can make them maybe go to a side and tell them, hey, what you said made me feel uncomfortable. Um, this is, you know, it shows prejudice and bias, and you can explain them the reasons why you think that is the case in that situation or with that particular comment and. Um, and, and since most people do do it subconsciously, uh, we hope that uh, most people will understand and be better next time. Um, assertiveness, that you should respond assertively, expressing discomfort and setting boundaries, which is the same thing that we talked about during bullying, same, same as, aspect, especially if the person is very hostile and they don't, and they basically, they double down on the microaggression. In such a case, you must, be, uh, you should be, you should be uh, assertive towards them and respond uh, in a sort of voice that what that they're making you feel uncomfortable and if necessary um you should basically report them to the authorities like i said uh, most workplaces nowadays they do have policies against microaggressions and you can take the you can basically report them they have in every company has internal guidelines on how to report microaggressions um so you should take those channels um uh, and report it to the proper uh people authorized to deal with that type of behavior um Seek support, same thing uh, that we discussed in bullying. Reach out to friends, colleagues. Don't just internalize it and keep taking it. Uh, uh, make sure you seek support from um, appropriate sources. And last one is advocacy. Same thing. We must advocate the people, um, educate them about it, uh, educate them about it. And if we see if we see other people getting, if we see other victims who are being um, 
targeted through microaggressions, then we should stand up for them and tell them tell the part, tell the person, hey, the comment was inappropriate towards that particular group of people, if they even if they don't belong to our group um, or from our religious or ethnic background. But if somebody makes a racist comment towards an African American, for example, uh, or says something which shows bias towards African American in some way, uh, we should point that out and say that's not appropriate. Um, so that's still some of the ways. And there's a lot more literature on this. People can research online as well. And um, there's a lot of reading materials, a lot of videos, a lot of YouTube videos about this that go into more detail. Uh, there even have been done like uh, PhDs on this uh, that you can look up, or you can look up their dissertations. So there's a lot of research on this topic that people who are more interested in more deeper look into the topics, uh, they can go and find out more, inshallah. That's pretty much it. I know I ended a little earlier. Uh, I wasn't sure how long I would take, so I made it 10 slides, uh, hoping I thought I might go over, actually. Uh, but I'm four minutes short, so that's fine. So I can end it here. All right. Uh, Jazak Mullah Khair and uh, Brother Ramiz for enlighten, enlightening us with, even though some of these terms and terminologies are familiar, um, but putting it in a perspective where we should think and reflect over the scenarios and the situations that we could be presented with on a daily, day-to-day -day basis, um, interacting uh, with uh, different uh, associates or people at work, um, at school, um, even even standing in the grocery line. Um, all of that, um, it, we we it it was a very healthy uh, you know opener to understanding. Uh, what bullying means and um, and how to respond to microaggressions like you have here. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of, uh, before the presentation, if you have any questions that you would like to have answered by Brother Ramiz here right now, um, uh, you, you feel free to uh, uh, type it in your chat box as it is in front of you and uh, we will get those answered uh, to you, um, uh, answered for you. Uh, one question that has come in, um, Brother Ramiz, is do you see uh, cyberbullying becoming more commonplace or more prevalent now than physical place bullying? Now, this doesn't eradicate physical place bullying at all, but do you see with the onslaught of social media that now it's become more prevalent, more common, and even perhaps even more acceptable? Oh, absolutely, because you have, with internet, you have um, free access to people, and also you have the cloak of, um, you know, invisibility, because you can be whatever username you want, um, and nobody would know who you are, right? And so you can say whatever you want, however you want, and there's no repercussions, right? And because, you know, as they say, the internet is like basically a jungle, right? Uh, there's no laws. You can do, say, whatever you want. You can just do, you can find whatever you want. Uh, and so it's definitely more prevalent on cyberbullying um, uh, uh, than probably physical bullying because it's easier to do so. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of invisibility. And people who might, so you'll find like bullies on, on the internet who will probably never bully a person in real life because, I don't, I don't know, maybe they just don't have the guts or they don't have the capacity to do it, but they will basically harass them online. And there have been multiple cases like that. Uh, so I would say definitely, yes, it will be more, it will be more obvious on the, on, on the internet. Okay, so online bullying or, or displaying even macroaggressions would be, uh, for example, the online uh, feature is more of a smoke screen for what's really going on. Um, yes, definitely. Um, uh, another question for you is that where, if cyberbullying is taking place, then where can it be reported? How do you report cyberbullying if, like you just said, you can virtually basically say or do anything to anyone without quote unquote getting caught? So how do you how do you go about reporting that? So yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, honestly. With the internet, it's more difficult uh, because there's very little accountability. Uh, I mean, some people have some people have been successful in um, getting accounts closed by reporting it to um, like Twitter. Uh, they have like uh, you know report this tweet or report this tweet to Facebook. But a lot of them also get rejected. They say, well, we don't see anything wrong with this and blah blah blah. Uh, um, so what? So some people how they deal with it is, and that's how I personally would deal with it as well. Is somebody's if somebody's harassing me online, I'm just gonna block them. Um, because then basically uh, there's nothing they can they can't see you they can't see your post uh, you can't see them so they just get blocked so they'll basically have to create a new account right 
and you can keep locking them, but they're just gonna have to create, make more email addresses. It's just burdensome, burdensome, burdensome for them. Um, you can also mute people on Twitter, at least. Uh, so that's how people deal with it. But honestly, unless somebody is making a direct threat against you, like through your life, there's very little that companies will do something. And like I said, internet is a, the internet is a jungle, right? Um, uh, so how? So it's very difficult to basically uh, manage that. Unless, uh, see, there's another way. If the person who is doing it on the internet, if, if their ID is not like invisible, um, and then you could track that person down. Uh, and if it's like a coworker, then you can report that to um, your uh, supervisors. Or and if it's um, although I don't know if they will do anything since it didn't take place in the workplace, so I have no, I'm not sure how that would deal with it. Um, but right now, honestly, right now blocking is probably the best means that I know of that that, that I know most people practice. But there should definitely be more ways to get things done. Um, but there haven't been as of yet because, like I said, the internet is a jungle. Right, and you could we could also say that because a lot of these larger social media platforms, they themselves allow or entertain a sort of bullying online. Uh, they don't, as you were saying, they don't condone it right off, and it it's it can be a struggle to report it. But it doesn't mean that we can we should stop trying. We need to continue trying, um, and the more. Uh, of of us who report it, the the more it gets noticed and comes under awareness, um, and it definitely, as we're as you've been mentioning, it needs to be reported. Um, it shouldn't be just swept under the rug. It definitely. Um, so and and the process of advocating, you were talking about uh, advocating that we need to advocate for anti-bullying measures. What would that process entail? What I mean, just even if you would just give us a brief step-by-step -step overview. Uh, what it takes to advocate for this anti-bullying, whether it's cyberbullying, whether it's workplace bullying, physical acts of bullying, um, microaggressions, etc. What what can you what can we do as an individual and as a society as whole as a whole to uh, be involved in this process? As individuals, uh, number one is educating ourselves on what bullying is exactly and all these different forms and how it formats, how it you know. Um, Basically, uh, how, how, it's vis how it's basically implemented uh, from the bully. Uh, just educating yourself on the action, the, the act of bullying itself. Uh, also, there's a lot of uh, things which I didn't cover here uh, in detail, but there's ways how, like how to respond to the bully in that particular situation. So, when if you do come across that situation for yourself, you know how to respond in that particular situation. Um, you can uh, so you should definitely follow those steps as well. Um, also, if you see someone else being bullied, then you should stand up for them as well, especially if you feel safe. Um, if you don't feel safe, uh, there's also, you know, you should, refer to, you should report it to the uh, appropriate authorities. But it's always something we can do. Either we are the, uh, either we are the perpetrators of bully, bullying, so we should stop. We should recognize that what I'm doing is bullying. Number two, or, or somebody is bullying us and we have to have the appropriate response and the procedures in place to make the bully stop. Or number three, someone else is being bullied, and we have to stand up for that person, that victim, uh, and come some capacity and, and, and stop them from being uh, bullied. So this is what an individuals can do. As for a society as a whole, then basically we should promote a culture of, hey, I got your back, you got my back. We're not going to allow it. Just make like a coalition amongst your coworkers or your co-students. Then, hey, we're not going to allow. We're going to come together because what happens often is that somebody's being bullied, and um, no one stands, it's, only, it's the person by themselves that is fearful of standing up by themselves for that person. So they'll con let, let it happen. But you have a, if you have a collective of many individuals coming together and standing as one, uh, then it's easier for everyone to stand up. So having this like, uh, you can see, for, for example, for kids, we tell them to take pledges that we will not allow bullying in our schools. Um, we can do, you can do the same work with coworkers as well, that, hey, we're not going to allow this type of behavior. Uh, and we'll, if somebody is being bullied, we're all going to stand up together and stand up for the victim and say, hey, stop doing that. Stop bullying that person. You can't, you can't do that. You can't say that. Stop that. Stop your behavior and stop picking on that person or whatever it may be. Right. So along, going along with that point, um, when we oftentimes, at least for myself, I know, and maybe for others who are listening right now or watching right now, when we think of the word bullying, um, it often reduces it to just on a child's level. Um, sometimes and many times we don't perceive that to be uh, as an adult something that would uh, affect us or something that relates to us. But as you were mentioning about in your second part about microaggressions, 
um, you could could we say that microaggressions, for example, are a lack of emotional intelligence on the part of the one who's doing it, on the part of the instigator, the intimidator, the bully themselves? Or is it because they themselves display a certain level of a, a lack of intelligence, a lack of emotional intelligence? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I would say that uh, um, microaggressions are probably more common in workplace environment among adults. <laughs> and even like you were saying, grocery store lines <laughs> and things like that, uh, <clears throat> especially in the workplace environment, I would say, yeah, so among adults, microaggressions would probably probably be more common. That, that, does not, that doesn't mean um, bullying doesn't happen among adults. It definitely does because we see it on the news and we hear about it all the time. Uh, and we see videos of on social media, people, you know, uh, being bullied, and um, but um, but microaggressions, I would say, is definitely more common. And yes, the factors you indicated is definitely a uh, root cause of these things. Um, and ignorance in general. And like I said in my presentation, um, uh, in many cases, uh, not all, but many cases, uh, the person might not even be knowledgeable enough to know that what they're doing is a form of bias or prejudice. Right. Right. Um, another question coming to you is, what can you do, for example, if a supervisor, a manager, your boss threatens to, uh, you know, your res your resignation, or, th or uh, threatens you by attributing you to something negative that you did not do, and you're in a place or and you're in a predicament or situation where you're not able to record, as you said, that you should record everything mm -hmm. that's happening and going on in terms of reporting. Uh, the microaggression or the bullying to the proper authorities. What do you do in that sense when you're at, in that moment of not able, to, not being able to record, jot anything down? What would you do post incident, right? Immediately. Follow the procedures of your company. Uh, they all have procedures. Uh, if, even if something doesn't happen, um, I mean, if, if something, if you don't have anything documented, you have to, you have to report it in some capacity uh, to appropriate uh, supervisors. And like I said, each company has policies, um, at least the major ones. They all have policies on how to go about reporting, even if there's no, you know, quote unquote evidence for it. Uh, you do have to report it, and they might be called in for questioning and things like that. So you can make um, a statement in that way, or if you have witnesses, you can try to bring them forward. They can be anonymous um, if they want to, and they can do it that way. Uh, but yeah, you should still, you still, you still need to go to the proper channels. Um, look at the policies carefully of your company that you join and what the policy exactly says and how to report incidents. And, uh, maybe you'll be assigned a particular task case manager from your company and you, you can talk to them and get more insights like, Hey, this happened with the supervisor. Uh, I don't have any evidence right now, but this actually did occur in a private, um, meeting between me and him or me and her and, uh, please tell me how do I, you know, how, how do I properly get this, you know, resolved, or how do I uh, report this, you know, properly, and they'll and they'll be able to guide you further. Um, another question for you is um, honestly, sometimes it's difficult to discern between a microaggression and on one side and someone being overly sensitive on the other side. Now there are uh, organizations and workplaces and businesses where culturally certain things are done how they're done just because of the way that people behave in the environment over a certain period of years that determines the the you know the culture is made so keeping that in perspective how can you draw the line between someone who seems like they're maybe displaying or verbalizing certain microaggressions or or on the one side and also you have some the, the person who's um, perhaps being overly sensitive, how can you, what would you do or how, what would you advise to someone to, to be able to, if, because you don't want to uh, misreport anything, but at the same time, you don't want to overlook anything. Right. I would say, uh, um, I would say if you have a, if you have like a, uh, good relationship with that particular person, um, you should definitely reach out to them personally. Uh, and a lot of people will appreciate uh, if you reach out to them personally. So they may not be thinking that they're being oversensitive and they may not know, like, like, like the questioner said, and because of the culture. So they may be absorbed into the culture so deeply that they can't really tell, like to them it's an everyday thing, they, they're not seeing it. So maybe you can um, get them on maybe on a one-on-one -on -one and just explain to them that how their comment was insensitive or how it made you feel uncomfortable 
or how it hurts your feelings, uh, you can do it. You can try. You can try to talk to the person. Um, if, if this is if uh, uh, you can't really tell the difference, like it's very difficult. Is this person being oversensitive? Because there, yeah, there are going to be gray areas. Like, like you're not really going to. Okay, is this person like you know being oversensitive or is this a microaggression? Uh, so there might be some gray areas there. And so if you're not sure and you have a relationship with this person, a good understanding, just basically meaning like a professional relationship with this person, and they're not like picking on you or bullying you or they're not harassing you or anything. But you should definitely talk to them. Uh, you can send you can send them an email, um, letting them know your concerns, or you can try or you can try to talk to them in person. Uh, whatever is easy for you. Uh, beyond that, I'm to be honest, I'm not sure. Uh, would have to do we'll probably have to talk to a professional uh, and figure out how to determine that. Or you can also look at the policy of the company and see and talk to someone from HR and see. So how they how do they define? Because so you can talk to the HR and tell them that hey, this person said this particular thing. Um, you know, is this considered oversensitivity? I mean, like, would this is this considered um, um, uh, 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 like uh, uh, is this considered problematic or not? Like you know, so you can you can have a conversation with the assigned person at the company and figure that out to them as well. And maybe then they might want to have a meeting with that person as well, and just three of you sit together and talk it out, things like that. I mean, that's what I have right now in my mind. That's what I would do in my mind. Um, but each situation is different, and my some some other measures might be necessary. But uh, would have you know, we, I, I guess we would have to talk to a more professional person on the topic and see what other things we can do. Sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely. And just to remind ourselves what you had said in the beginning. You had said that one of the definitions of bullying is a a, someone who is uh, targeting the same person over and over again. Um, so that, yeah, in terms of microaggressions, and for someone who feels, who may not be so sure, is this a microaggression, or is this someone who just doesn't know well, or know any better, um, and, and you're right, that person would have to have had some sort of relationship beforehand uh, for it to feel like, okay, this is, this is some form of bullying that's taking place on me. Um, definitely. Um, uh, one, one, one other question uh, for you is that as a parent, um, how should I report bullying, uh, any sort of bullying incident uh, of my child at school? particularly if my child doesn't have the courage themselves to step up and report. Um, perhaps even sometimes the child is uh, exhibiting certain behaviors at home um, that are not normal or customary for that child. Um, and then we find out as a parent that they're undergoing this sort of trauma at school and they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to uh, you know, further implicate themselves and get further involved in it because it it creates more of a discussion and uh, being you know pinpointed on. Uh, what what can I do as a parent uh, to help my child report it in a way where they are not because of that being further bullied? That's a good question. Uh, I I have a very detailed discussion on this very particular topic on my more uh, on the longer version of this anti bullying workshop. Uh, that I cater towards kids um, and, and parents. And so you can find a very thorough discussion, but just to briefly um, do a brief thing. Number one, we have to understand that when our kids come to you or you find out they're bullying, being bullied, you have to try to stand up for them because if you don't stand up for them, then who's going to stand up for them? And we've seen throughout the years of how schools constantly ignore bullying um, and until it's too late. Uh, and uh, either the kid come, comes into a hospital or sometimes might, might even be killed or something. Um, or they take their own life, for example. Right. So if somebody is, if your child is being bullied, you have to stand up for them. Um, you know, I've done surveys of Muslim kids uh, asking them, how many of you guys would actually tell your parents if you were, were being bullied? Most of them always say they will not tell their parents. When I ask them why, and they say because one of two reasons, either they say that their parents will not do anything about it, that they tell them to, you know, just ignore it. Or they will say that my parents will make such a big deal out of it to embarrass me completely and then make a big like a circus show at my school and make me embarrass me even more. So they have these two fears. So we have to be, we have to be, have, we have to have like a balanced response. Um, when it comes to child being bullied, every school, every school is required to have an anti-bullying bullying policy at their school and a basically a set of procedures that a parent has to take. Uh, so number one, as a parent, you must basically uh, 
get that from your school. Hey, tell me what is your anti-bullying policy looks like. If my child is bullying, what do I need to do? Because this is very important because most of the schools get away from being taken responsibility of bullying being taken at their school because they say the parents do not follow our procedures. So they can get away with it. Um, so when you take them to court, they have nothing. They will say that uh, uh, this parent didn't take any of our, you know, precautionary you know, steps that are there. So every school has a policy listed. Like if you, if this child is being bullied, you need to fill out this form, contact this person, email this person, blah, 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 whatever that is. So you have to recognize what that is and you need to implement that accordingly with evidence uh, from your kid or from testimony or whatever it is. Um, and uh, so, so uh, um, now, now your child might, ha might have evidence, might not, but you still have to report it. Uh, so you have to let them know immediately. So if the child comes home and you or you find out that they're being bullied, you have to let the school know immediately. That's step number one. And then follow the procedures of what the school has. Uh, why? Because you want to protect yourself legally. Because if you need to take your school to court, then then you have something. Um, you have a you have evidence, a paper trail that you can point to. That hey, hey, I did go to school. I did report it to school. Here's the email that I sent. Okay, and uh, here's a response from the supervisor or from the principal or the, from the teacher, and this is what they said, and this is my follow-up email when my kid was still being bullied, and they didn't do anything about it, you know, so you can pick it up like that. Uh, for public schools, there's like a golden chain. We have, you first go to the teacher, if nothing, if it doesn't change, you go to the principal. If that doesn't change, you go to the uh, superintendent. If that doesn't change, then you go to the school board. So you keep going higher up the chain um, of authorities if nothing is happening. And, um, so those are those are brief points on how to uh, deal it. But please never tell the child that to ignore it. If your child comes to you finally and tells you that they're being bullied, you cannot tell them to ignore it because they probably already tried ignoring it. Because uh, that's the first response that a person has who is weaker in power in some capacity. They, they ignore it, but it keeps happening over and over again. So when they have come to you, they have already tried ignoring it. So when you tell them to ignore it, to them they translate in their heads, oh, they're not going to do anything about it. So it's very important to stand up for your kids and do a proper balanced response to bullying and familiar our, 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 familiarize ourselves with the process of the school uh, on how to respond to it. And if that doesn't work, then there are uh, different uh, ways, like I said, you can keep going up the chain on a higher level. Uh, authority, authority, above authority, set up meetings with a teacher, for the principal. No, say, no, I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to have a meeting with a, with a, with a parent of the bully. And, and, and parents will discuss this issue because this needs to stop and things like that. So you have to take um, those types of measures. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. I think we all would agree upon that. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Uh, well, that concludes our presentation and our discussion uh, for today. Please, everyone, remember to join us next Saturday, same time, same place, November 4th, as we will receive guidelines on racial sensitivity. What is it? What is racial sensitivity? And how can we manifest it in our own lives? So invite your family, uh, invite your friends uh, to join us, and you won't want to miss it. Again, on behalf of the Online Islamic Institute for Women of Ikna Sisters, I would like to thank you, Brother Ramiz, for taking out time, really, to be with us today out of your busy schedule. To our audience, please stay tuned for more upcoming programs, such as these coming your way from the Online Islamic Institute for Women. Until we meet again, everyone, please stay safe, stay safe, keep everyone in your laws. Jazakumullah khairan and again to all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum.